riding the avalanche, or embracing the greater gods, a controversial article by Alphonse Del Monse regarding the nature of chaos, the concept of evil, and man's culpability in the formation of the chaos gods. Forget what you have been told. Chaos is neither good nor evil. Chaos, being the very same place, state, and thing as the ether, is simply a mirror for the survivalist emotions of living beings within the mortal universe. Thus, the entities of chaos, be they gods or demons, exist solely because living things generate emotions and thoughts. Of all the intelligent races, we humans have proven to be the most eager to pursue the path to the glories of chaos, and our fervor and excitement in the service of chaos is unsurpassed. This fervor grants greater power to the gods of chaos, and in return they grant us their many blandishments and blessings. We humans lust for change and seek delight, and it is largely because of us, not the elder races, and our wonderful drive and ambition that the gods of chaos have grown so magnificent and bloated with power. Always remember, the chaos gods cannot and should not be called evil. They are simply exuberant personifications of all those things that make us human. For you see, the relationship between chaos and the mortal realms is entirely symbiotic, much more so than any cleric or priest of this dull empire would ever wish to admit. Chaos absorbs our own emotions and thoughts, from our most basic drives to our most complicated and high-minded ideals, and then magnifies and reflects those emotions and ideals straight back at us. But what bearing, you no doubt wish to know, does this have on the greater gods of chaos? To put it in layman's terms, over time, and for whatever reason, all emotions and their related concepts converge together within the chaos realm. It is a case of like attracting like, with every scrap of anger or every scrap of ecstasy, slowly being drawn to one another until they create what could be described as a kind of vortex of psychical energy within the chaos realm. A vortex of emotion and thought. That vortex creates such a disturbance across the chaos realm, and therefore our own psyche, that whatever emotional concept the chaos vortex is made from is then reflected back into the mortal realms once more. This has the effect of further promoting within our mortal psyches the emotion that the vortex itself is made from. Let's take anger as an example. If a man or woman feels a lot of anger, so over time the mortals will not only have their own naturally inspired and mundane anger, but will also experience a slightly more unnatural anger that has been reflected onto them by the Chaos Realm's anger vortex. This process is cyclical and never-ending, and in time the Chaos Realm's vortices and become so powerful that they cease to accidentally promote in mortal minds the emotions they embody, but actually begin to do so deliberately, although perhaps subconsciously, before they do so consciously. An analogy for this might be the boiling of water in a room. If one boils a big pan of water in a room with no ventilation, quite soon one will find that all the windows in the room become covered with a fine sheen of water. The temperature in the room will get warm and humid, and things will get wet. This is not the water that has evaporated from the pan consciously coming back to haunt us. It is just the natural consequence of boiling water in an airless room with glass windows. One might say that mortals are similar to bowls of boiling water, and that our emotions are like steam pouring from that bowl. This water vapour is trapped within the airless room that comprises of both our individual minds and the realm of chaos. This psychical condensation could be seen as the very beginnings of the chaos realm's vortices of emotion, senselessly reflecting back upon the 
airless room of our minds, the water vapor emotion that we first generated, making us even hotter, as it were, and thereby causing us to give off more of the same emotion that started the process in the first place. In time, all this psychic condensation creates the perfect environment for consciousness and intelligence to grow within the realm of chaos. Before the vortices become intelligent and self-aware, they first attain basic drives and needs, similar in their own way to the drives and needs of such mortal forms of life as plants. So now we have little shoots of consciousness growing upon the warm damp of the psychic condensation where our minds meet the chaos realm. Like a plant that leans towards the sun as it travels across the sky, not a conscious action, and yet still an action of a living thing, these shoots of intelligence within the chaos realm's vortices begin to lean towards these people and emotions that best nourish them. So, the vortex of anger might lean more towards those people who get angry most easily. The vortex of ecstasy and pleasure might lean more towards hedonists or those with heightened or more acute senses. The vortex for hope leans more towards those optimistic or ambitious people, and the chaos realm's vortices of fear and misery might lean more towards those people who tend towards a more nervous or depressive disposition. This natural, though metaphysical, process will then create a more specific reaction in mortals, because, where before, the condensation of the emotions that were reflected back from the realm of chaos were diffused and did not target any one person or another, the embryonic intelligence is developing within the chaos realm's vortices actually lean towards specific mortals, feeding off their emotions, and thereby promoting more acute versions of those emotions within those mortals. So, whereas the general miasma of anger that is reflected back from the Chaos Realm's anger vortex may affect all mortals to some small degree, the burgeoning intelligence of the steadily growing anger vortex will deliberately begin to lean towards those people who are particularly angry, and to a certain degree ignore those who are not. So the process continues, with all mortal anger feeding the burgeoning intelligence of the Chaos Realm's anger vortex, while the anger vortex specifically leans towards angry people, making them ever more angry, and so on, and so on. This process is never-ending, and as it continues, the Chaos Realm vortices intelligence slowly climbs the ladder of reason towards consciousness, perhaps similar to babies, from their mother's womb to birth and consciousness, promoting the emotions and concepts they personify more and more acutely, while becoming more and more specific in the people they target. Eventually, the day comes when they reach a level of intelligence whereby they realise, I am, and become fully self-aware. There is little or nothing that mortals can do to stop this process because, like a ball of snow rolling down a wintry slope, by the time mortals realise that there is an entity outside themselves encouraging them to do things, that entity has already achieved intelligence and is too powerful to stop or uncreate. A mortal could, I suppose, seek to stand in the way and try to stop the Chaos Realm's entities from growing any larger, as indeed so many fools often try to do by resisting the great liberators of the North. But to continue with the snowball allegory, the entities have already grown to the size of avalanches, and will more than likely crush anyone and anything attempting to block their path. In fact, because all mortals help start these avalanches, and are indeed part of them, inasmuch as we are all helping to provide the energy and momentum for their growth and descent, we couldn't really stand in their way in the first place. For indeed, every one of us is in fact sledging along behind the crest of these avalanches, most of us without ever even realising that we are. Those of us that do realise it, like myself, have moved forward to 
ride the crest of the avalanche and are making the most of the free ride, leaving those more fearful and ignorant to wait until they have been sucked under by the avalanche before they acknowledge their part in its existence, and, much more importantly, their dependence upon it. So, I say now, you who have chosen to question the received wisdom of others, more ignorant than yourselves, to truly emancipate yourselves, you must accept that it is impossible to know where your self-control ends and the control of the gods begins. And similarly, where your own emotions and ideas end and the projected emotions and ideas of the chaos gods begin. For indeed, can there really be any difference between the two?'